Morning all. There was a very interesting game in round five in the London Chess Classic between Vladimir Kramnik playing white, who had won the tournament, by the way, last year, and uh, his opponent, Luke McShane, playing black. So let's have a look at this game. So Vladimir kicked off with d4, not the English opening on this occasion. And of the d5, we have a very solid Slav, very popular nowadays. Knight f3, knight f6. And now knight c3, not too concerned about black taking on c4 at the moment. And in fact, after a6, you might think Vladimir should be concerned because maybe b5 is coming up. Well, actually, he just plays g3 here, allowing his c pawn to be taken. But he does make provision for it to uh, not be protected because he plays a4. Okay, so this is an interesting combination of a4 and g3. So b5 is prevented tactically just using that a file, that pin. Uh, so e6 was played, bishop g2. And now white potentially is going to use knight e5 to take on c4 with a small plus. Black strikes in the center with c5. Vladimir just castles here, and after c takes d4, knight takes d4. Okay, it seems black is a pawn up. Is this pawn that useful? Is it easy to protect? Well, one thing about the pawn, it supports these two squares, and it's this which maybe is noticed by Luke. So with knight bd7, he has a potential idea of knight c5 to b3, which would seem to be very annoying to white as a general plan. Here, Vladimir plays knight c2 as though maybe knight a3 to collect this c4 pawn if black casually, for example, plays bishop e7. But black doesn't casually play bishop e7, black plays queen c7. And there's a little bit of a downside to this move if it is going to be followed up with, after bishop f4, the move e5. As we know from many games on this channel, e5 is often a cause of total disaster. Giving up d5, this diagonal is sometimes dangerous, the light squares are sometimes weakened. Sometimes e5, a very committal central pawn move, loses some solidity for the whole position. Will that be the case here? The bishop just goes back humbly to d2, which you might, might not think is at all aggressive. You might think, well, why not, for example, bishop g5? Well, maybe, and we'll check this out in the second pass, bishop g5, maybe there's h6 on bishop g5. So bishop d2, white can't be attacked immediately. All the pieces um, are waiting here without being interrupted now by black. And this is an opportunity maybe for black to just get on with developing and casting safely. For example, bishop c5. But there's a slight concern, perhaps, that knight e3 could be on the cards. And then after that, knight d5. So actually, we see another seemingly non-stereotypical move, knight c5. Black is also, of course, tempted by knight b3 here, which looks quite punishing for white, you know, using that extra pawn immediately without yet uh, having to seemingly develop the bishop here in castle. Now Vladimir uses the same bishop for bishop g5 in this position with big difference, huge difference. Uh, the, without the knight on d7 here, he's threatening severe structural damage, it would seem, in any case. But um, black, in this position, decides that the c-pawn might be worth the structural damage just to support it more strongly, and offers the structural damage. And of course, the dark square bishop might be an asset. Well, let's see what happened. Bishop takes f6 was taken. So Vladimir has assessed this as okay for him, even though he's a pawn down here. 
this double pawn complex might not be good for f5 in particular and the light squares would seem to be for, for white. White is controlling the light squares quite nicely. And in fact, knight d5 now, attacking the queen. Black doesn't want to give up the light square bishop. And also has to protect, of course, f6 as well as, as the queen. So queen d8. And then we see knight c e3. And now knight b3 being used. So is the rook going to go to an awkward place? And you might think visually, well, okay, is is this is this quite a bad position for white because of knight b3? Maybe black later can now like support this pawn with say rook c8 if the rook moves to an awkward square. And where would that leave white? Well, what we see here is actually actually quite a staggering, a staggeringly powerful move. I wonder if you can guess it. It requires quite a lot of imagination and calculation. I think both. If I give you ten seconds, or you might want to pause the video, what would you play here as white? So starting from now, ten seconds starting from now. Okay, Vladimir is not interested in rook b1 or rook a2. He plays actually a5, and with the king still in the center, it seems that if it takes, then queen a4 check could be potentially very dangerous and awkward for black. And then queen d7 will be out of the question because of knight f6 check. So, for example. We'll just very, very briefly touch on this. Queen d7 does knight f6 check. But on bishop d7, I think black here can afford to play queen takes c4 and then collect this knight leisure and has compensation for the exchange. But we'll check this out in the second pass in greater detail. But maybe for this reason, knight takes a1 wasn't played. Instead, supporting the pawn, white is also potentially going to munch this pawn, rook c8, but now the pawn is attacked with that rook which wasn't taken. We see rook a4, an unusual development. Okay, so we see now knight d4, which tries to interfere with d5, so if it takes, then black can take and then take on d5. But uh, knight b6, more pressure on the c pawn. Look at this, building up pressure on that c pawn to try and recollect it. Quite a dramatic battle for the c4 pawn here. And after rook c7, you might think white will take c4 with maybe a knight here. Another very surprising move is played. Also, of course, rook c7 was defending that b7. That bishop's now eyeing the whole diagonal here. So it's getting to be quite an aggressive position for white, with black still not castled. Can you guess what white plays in this position? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, an exchange sacrifice. Rook takes c4. What is going on here, you might ask? Well, with this exchange sacrifice, this is the light square defender. These light squares are going to be weaker than before. d5, f5. So, a light square exchange sacrifice in particular. Let's see how this works. So, black did take it here. If he doesn't, well, I think black's just worse if he doesn't. He's worse anyway, I think. Knight e takes c4. Okay. And there are some horrible threats in this position. Now, also, e3 is, of course, facilitated. The e pawn is free to move. And then the queen could be a menace, either on this diagonal or maybe along this diagonal. Knight b5, we see actually no time for e3 here. So, queen b1 on this diagonal. 
Queen's got some entry points like f5 in particular, which could be really dangerous. Okay, it's a tricky position indeed, because there's also a horrible thing like rook d1 as well to factor in. These knights are very aggressive in this position. Black plays the surprising queen d4, offering a tempo gain to rook d1 just to put the queen on c5. And actually, now we see the move e3, quite a little move, exchange down. But what is black doing? He's not going to be able to easily castle, surely. Because you can imagine a construction like queen f5, bishop e4, pointing at h7 if black castled. So if black can't castle, how does the king get to be safe and connect the rooks up? We see bishop e7. And our queen f5 definitely prepared for things like bishop e4. We see the king going to f8 just manually, leaving the rook to defend that h7 pawn. Things have gone wrong, it seems, for black. Although the exchange up, it clearly looks a bit miserable, especially this bishop and these double pawns and all these weak light squares around the position. Okay, so we see bishop d5 now. And there might be an immediate threat of queen h5 here, just on that f7 pawn. King g7. And this is starting to look quite nasty. After queen g4 check, if king f8, it may be that queen h5 is obvious and strong, because how does black actually defend? f7 okay maybe moving the bishop but it looks very very dangerous indeed but this next move looks exceptionally dangerous too black plays king h6 and now vladimir plays e4 not only supporting d5 but knight e3 to f5 is now on the cards the rook can't even challenge the queen with rook g8 here so black seems to have um, a terrible position with the only concession it seems, the d4 square. He plays knight d4, now knight e3, and that knight is the only defender of f5 here. Black plays f5 in this position, offering a pawn to try and relieve some of the pressure. Check after king g7 we see yet another exchange sacrifice. Rook takes d4. Now if queen takes d4 then knight f5 wins the queen. So e takes d4 is played. If, if black throws in the check then rook d1 doesn't help. So e takes d4, knight takes f5 check. So two exchanges down with how many pawns? Three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Just a pawn for the two exchanges. The king is getting kicked around now. Check. And now, can you spot this next move? Which must have been precisely calculated. If I give you 10 seconds from now. Okay, Vladimir tears into Black's king safety with bishop takes f7 check. Does the king dare to take this? Isn't that just queen g7 check? That looks pretty nasty. And then just carry on the attack, maybe even after taking the rook. But we'll explore the possibilities technically in the second pass. Black decided it wasn't best to take that bishop here. The king tries to make an escape for it. King d8. We've got a good old fashioned king hunt. Queen g7. The rook flees to f8, where it's protected by that bishop. But now a third pawn for the two exchanges. Is that right? Knight takes d4. So we have two, three, four, five, six now. One, two, three. Three pawns for the two exchanges. Immediate threat, knight e6 check, winning the queen. This is parried, 
with rook c6 offering an exchange sack in return so white would only be one exchange down for three pawns which is good uh, so Vladimir accepts this invitation what else did black have here though the king cannot run any further it's, it's blocked off by this knight so rook c6 was played knight takes c6 only one exchange down the queen if it's not holding up d4 then if queen c takes c6 maybe queen d4 is strong here but we'll, we'll check this out in the second pass b takes c6 was played also the queen's of course eyeing f2 here so if this bishop moves queen f2 and tables would turn but um the bishop can be usefully left on f7 for a moment with this next move queen g4 threatening to mate black on the spot the king moves to c7 now we see check king b8 and now a very interesting move indeed with the king on b8 and the queen here this next move unveils a new threat in the position hope you can see it knight d7 check is now threatened full king king and queen and also now of course queen f4 might be dangerous along that diagonal supporting a5 as well so what can black do about this knight d7 threat okay and if queen d6 that doesn't help because there's also the rook to pick up so taking bishop takes knight d7 check would fork king rook as well so queen d6 doesn't help so the king actually helps himself with king c7 and we see this check again and in this position a different idea instead of repeating leaving that bishop still on f7 white plays now king g2 okay if the brook dares to leave then surely check here is mating on a8 so for example check is going to be mate so the rook can't <coughs> leave there bishop d6 is played and now there's a bit of overloading on white's position b4 is played so what is happening here surely actually the queen can just take and still protecting the bishop what about c6 or is there some other menacing possibility the queen in this position does leave the c6 pawn unprotected with queen d4 and the c6 pawn is taken because again that bishop is immune to rook c8 and queen a8 all the time queen c8 and queen a8 mating and the queen's also protecting e4 so how many pawns have been collected now so many king a7 and now in this position again the bishop's still immune and vladimir plays king h3 just getting out of trouble on this f file with f2 so he's maybe starting to be ready to move this bishop soon without it being check on f2 we see queen d1 as though h5 is going to be useful but um knight c8 check is played winning both exchanges back now so just leaving white many pawns up actually queen h5 is not even threatened pardon me the bishop's protecting h5 the threat was queen f1 and that's used here queen f1 but after king g4 black is running out of checks really and several pawns down plays h5 check and Vladimir just takes this knowing that his queen's actually protecting h3 as well and against queen e2 maybe there's queen g4 here but uh, black's had enough here and resigned I believe we've witnessed here one of the more brilliant games of the tournament I think it's actually eligible for our brilliancies playlist I hope you would agree there were two exchange sacrifices in this game 
very nifty rook manoeuvre as a preparation for the first exchange sack. Uh, the second exchange sack led to a good old fashioned king hunt. The bishop immune on f7 was very interesting at various points. Okay, let's check now engine view in more detail. So in this position, in this final position, if check, maybe even stronger than queen g4, is g4, is that really the case? Isn't queen g4 also good? That should be good as well, but it is losing a couple of pawns here. So let's go with g4, just losing e4. Check. Takes. And OK. Say white plays king h6. I mean, these pawns are irresistible. It's so many extra pawns. Uh, unless there's a perpetual check, which seems unlikely, then um, this looks pretty bad. If h4 here, black can't even take here because of check, and loses that pawn as well, which is not very nice. And it's going to be an easy win here. Okay, I think the checks will. It's hardly any checks to factor in anyway. The checks are going to run out. Mason 22 now. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's let's go back and see what happened during the course of this game. Where did White get the advantage? Did Black really blunder at some point? So a6 here, g3. Black takes. A4, G2 now C5, seems fair enough. White castled. After the CD, Knight takes D4. Knight BD7. Now Knight C2. We see Queen C7, which Jim thinks is reasonable here. You might think that's surprising that E5 later. Um, but if if black like plays bishop e7, then knight e3, as mentioned, and now it's quite difficult to hold c4. If queen c7 here, queen d4, c4 is a bit of a problem. If black has to give up the dark square bishop, that is a major concession, surely. This position has good compensation here. Pressure. But uh, let's go back. So we see queen c7, bishop f4, e5, bishop goes back to d2. If it went to g5, let's have a quick look at this. Bishop g5, then just h6, as mentioned. So that would be fine for black, it seems. So um, about the structural damage anyway. So bishop d2, we see knight c5. Bishop goes back again, and now you know knight b3 here might apparently be possible as well. But bishop e6 was played, which is uh, looks okay as well on the surface to offer double pawns to hold on to this extra pawn, isn't it? A solid extra pawn. That's the question. So pawns were doubled, giving up the dark square bishop. But it's the light squares that white will enjoy playing on now. So knight d5, queen d8. The other knight comes to support d5. And then we see knight b3. And the rook is not playing these feeble moves as the engine points out at depth 16. Rook b1 or rook a2. This is where the more imaginative move was played. It comes in here now, depth 17, a5, the idea of a5 and queen a4 check. And it's rejected again after. So is it slightly murky? a5. Let's check it out. So a5. Let's go for it now. If knight takes a1, we'll go with the check. Bishop d7, forced. Virtually no other 
if I just take queen e7 and knight f6. So let's go with bishop d7, queen takes c4, and we arrive at this position. What's the immediate threat? It seems as though knight c7 is threatened. Let's just check this out, make sure. Knight c7 is the major threat here. Uh, and if king e7, well, the other knight can come in, it's like mating black. So knight c7 has to be parried. Okay, so doesn't leave too many options. You might think, well, hold on a sec. Bishop c6, is that possible to parry knight c7? Let's go with bishop c6. Maybe white just takes here, and it seems a great position. What's the threat here for white? Just coming back with rook d1, and that leaves black in a terrible state, actually. Uh, so, if we go with bishop d6, There's awful possibilities like knight takes f6 here and, and bishop c6, as mentioned just, just earlier, but even stronger, just rook d1. And let's imagine black tries to castle. Just queen h4, threatening knight f6 check. And bishop d5, knight f5, threatening now queen g4, forget about d5, threatening queen g4, mating on g7 here. Rook takes d5. What's the threat? Just rook takes d6. For a moment. Queen f6. It's pretty nasty. This is a very nasty continuation. So black is faced with a lot of problems here. So let's go back to this position after rook c8 to try and defend knight c7. Let's go with this suggestion queen h4. In this position, queen h4, i f6. So black tries to defend that, say, with rook c6 or bishop e7 or bishop g7. Why why not bishop e7? Let's, let's rule that out because it isn't mentioned. Just knight takes e7 here, and it's pretty nasty. Either way, knight d5 check will give, knight d5 will give an advantage here, it would seem. This is pretty nasty. This position, well, I can get the exchange back, then take on a1 with advantage. Okay, and what of other possibilities? Rook c6, more stubborn. Rook takes a1 again. There's compensation for the exchange that the light squares are really good here for white, but concretely, does black have resources like f5? This is where it starts to look a little bit murky. If if we had this position, it looks a little bit murky. Uh, what does white play here? Does he really want the, the queens coming off? Queen h5, knight b6. It looks it looks as though this is rook d1 is now very dangerous. In this position. Okay, and there's other threats as well. So we can potentially arrive in a murky position, but it it seems uh, unpleasant uh, for black f from a human point of view. But um, okay, m maybe. I mean, this this might be analysed for some time. This knight takes a one, um, but um, it wasn't it wasn't taken here, and um, perhaps it was. The lesser evil. This this could be a little bit of a blunder not to take this rook in this position. Instead, we see uh, rook c8, and now rook a4 is really liked by the engine. Rook a4. Uh, so c4 really under fire. Knight d4. Knight b6 really liked. Just just getting ganging up on c4. And the exchange stack is really liked by the engine as well. Everything now flows kind of logically, really. After this rook wasn't taken, the exchange stack more powerful than knight takes c4. In fact, is knight c4 actually playable? Say, say knight e takes c4. 
M maybe it is. Maybe it is playable. Or not, not even like BC4. Okay, I mean, Bishop C5, black, black hasn't got a problem. So that knight on B6 is very aggressive, entrenched. Keep the knight on B6, whatever happens. So, but this is this is the most aggressive it seems. Rook takes C4. Okay, and the exchange tax taken, and White's got great compensation for the exchange. Here yeah, it seems. So we see. Knight b5 coming up. Whoops. Knight b5. <laughs> I've overloaded the engine here. Queen b1. Very good move again. Just just keeping that pressure on the light squares. Queen d4. What what else is there if queen d4? It looks a bit strange. Say so black can play bishop g7. Rook d1, the queen's been forced in a very passive square. If queen e7 here, then knight d5 is nasty. So if the queen's been tucked on b8, it doesn't look very good at all. e3 to keep the knight out. And here, knight d7 might be good, just to win the exchange, an exchange back. Or even just keeping it for a moment longer. After bishop e4, yeah, white's advantage is, is clear here, dominating the position. So, uh, okay, queen b4, we see queen d4, which probably didn't help black's cause too much. Queen coming to c5 instead. Okay, e3, keeping the knight out of d4. And the queen comes in. King f8. Not seen as a great move by the engine. H5 might be a better resistance. But even here, bishop f1. Let's go with bishop f1. And it's dangerous for black. Let's go with uh, knight d5. This position. Can win an exchange. H4, and again, white's advantage is, is clear. It's the light square domination. Really. So uh, okay, so this this doesn't help Black King F8 it doesn't help Black too much. Bishop D5. The bishop's really an attacking piece. I think the threat is Queen H5. Is that right? No. In fact, Knight takes E5 here it might be even stronger. <laughs> Threatening Knight D7. Forking if takes Queen F7. So Knight takes E5. I think is the principal threat, actually. So we see King G7. Check, and this this is dire now, of course. E4. I think mean, everything's quite good here. Knight D4. Knight comes back to E3. Logically, to get to that F5 square. After F5, check. We got a good old-fashioned King hunt here. Rook takes D4. Check. Check. Now, Bishop F7, the most powerful accurate move, is played by Vladimir, it seems. One of the most powerful, Bishop F7 at this depth, anyway. Bishop F7. So what would happen if, if king the king took? Then queen G7. Put the king on... Say, say we'll put it on E6. Might have time to take on D4 first. Taking is okay, but uh, even stronger... Then taking the rook, check, 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 check. You can eventually win the queen, basically. You just win the queen here. Inevitably, the king is just too unsafe to be chased like that. So, even stronger than taking the rook, but uh, okay, that was avoided. King d8. Queen g7, the rook. There's not too many choices here for black. Either rook f8 or e8. So knight takes d4, threatening knight e6, I believe, is the major threat of mate in one. It's not a bad threat, as well as not just winning the queen. Mate in one is threatened. So rook c6 is uh, virtually the only move to keep playing here. 
So now white has just got too much for just the one exchange down really check. Now queen uh, well there's various ways I think of playing this. Queen d2 now threatens knight d7 principal threat again. So king c7 what, what else was there? Interesting computer move. Bishop g5 is actually technically possible here. Again knight d7 And in this position, Queen D1, what's going on here? Okay, the Queen and Rook still fought. Rook D8. Queen G4. Wow, what what is this about? If it takes here, bishop e8. Black's overloaded, losing all the bits. So even even that doesn't doesn't do anything here. Okay, so this this knight d7 um, is is very powerful. So we see king c7. Check in the position again, and now king g2. So with the bishop immune, it's it's. Uh, it's not nice this position to play. Bishop d6. I mean, what's this other alternative? Queen d6 looks hopeless because of taking a knight d7. But <laughs> technically, that's the best move. It's just pawns up for white uh, in this opposite color bishop ending. It doesn't really help black the opposite color bishops. So, uh, okay, so king g2, we saw bishop d6. We're talking plus 10 now. Oh dear, b4, good move. Okay, winning that um, c6 pawn seems is the main idea. And protecting e4. King h3, a good move. Just getting out of the way of trouble on f2. So queen h5 is not even threatened because the bishop's on on h5. We see knight c8 check. So just several pawns up now. Okay. <laughs> and here black resigned. So I don't know if it's a, an advanced case of materialism punished. Usually in um, the Slav defense, there is an ongoing debate in Slav defense games of all levels about taking on c4 and clinging on to it. Can black cling on to it? And win the end game or something, or just use the squares the extra pawn has, like b3 or d3. Well, this this game was evidence that uh, sometimes white can can make use of black trying to cling on to c4 and start sacrificing exchanges to get a good old-fashioned king hunt. Quite enjoyable, I think. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.